Peace. Um, I'm Kirk Anthony James. I go by Jay. I have today in the studio my really great friend and comrade, um, Cameron Rasmussen. Hey. Peace. And today we're going to have a conversation that really started at uh, SOAR, um, Society for Social Work and Research in 2020 in DC. And we did this really dope uh, presentation, a plenary, invited plenary at that, right? Invited symposium. Invited symposium. And we titled it The Road to Abolition. Um, social work, what was the rest of the title? The Road to Abolition, Slavery, Mass Incarceration, and Social Work in 2020. Ooh, fire. <laughs> so it was a really dope conversation. And we really wanted to kind of like build on that. You know, there was so much momentum at SOAR for people who had never had these conversations, people that wanted to be a part of these conversations. And today it's really going to be Kevin and I kind of like freestyling about like what abolition is in our minds, um, how we can get social work more aligned with something that we feel is very much, it's part of its organizing value, if not its organizing value. So welcome, welcome today. This is our first real episode of Evolve in Justice. And I'm super happy to have um, Cam here and, and to have this conversation. Yeah. So let's let's just pop it off. Yeah. I mean, the first question is, how did you yeah. end up? How did you come to abolition? Um, how did I come to abolition? Mm -hmm. uh, so abolition for me is really like you know, there's this word. Let let me go back. There's this word. Um, it's called sankofa, and it means to really understand where we are and where we're going. We have to go back. So for me, when I look at my experience in this world as a black man, my experience has been like a history of oppression. You know, it's a history of like a continuation, being born in a country where there was political instability that resulted in violence, um, being, you know, 18 years old, incarcerated in New York City during the period that would be ultimately classified as mass incarceration. Uh, really forced me to look at these systems, right? So when I think about abolition, you know, the, the thing that I haven't mentioned as yet is like prisons. I think people often associate prisons immediately with abolition. Yet for me, when I think about abolition, the first thing that comes to mind is um, a quote by Frederick Douglass, who said that abolition is not only a world without slavery, but it is a transformation of society. So for me, when I think about abolition, it's directly connected to my life and, and my experiences as a black man who's like essentially experienced nothing but like oppression. So for me, abolition is not just like, you know, a world without prisons. It's, it's ultimately the transformation of society that is not predicated on the exploitation of people of color. Mm. And our, our journeys to this moment are so different. <laughs> uh, because I'm, the criminal legal system was made for my safety. Yeah. Right. And you have I, a really dope story. Right? Yeah. Well, it's well, yeah. I was 13, yeah. and I was. This is like the third or fourth time I had stolen uh, cassettes from Tower Records in Sacramento, and I was stealing. What, a, what, what tape? I stole a Rage Against the Machine tape, not knowing I would grow up to be a, a little revolutionary. But uh, <laughs> I got caught, and I remember my parents came and picked me up. I got cuffed, but I didn't actually get taken away, and they, they I was on probation for a little bit and nothing really happened. And yeah. then when I was 19, I got a DUI for smoking weed, and I was arrested, and I did like four hours in jail, and then I was released, and it was a long story, and I, in the end, the criminal legal system didn't really have that much of a negative impact on my life, and like the places where it did, whiteness sort of protected me. Yeah. And so and then I, so fast forward like many years, I remember Jazz Hayden, you remember you know Jazz yeah, Hayden? Yeah. So Jazz Hayden is OG activist. Shout to Jazz, OG. Yeah. There was a panel at Riverside Church. It was Michelle Alexander, Jazz Hayden, Mark yeah. Lamont Hill, uh, and that. Angela Davis. And I'm this is I'm pretty new to this work. And yeah. Jazz is like, we need to get rid of all prisons everywhere, something like this. And I'm like, this dude's crazy. <laughs> What's he talking about? And you consider yourself radical at that point, right? I don't know. I was earlier in my politicization, yeah. but I like, yeah, I considered myself someone who cared about social justice and was like on a radical path. Yeah. But I thought he was crazy. I was like, no, yeah, this absolutely. dude. And I'm like, if if that's what your belief is. You didn't walk us there at all. You just you just jumped there, and, I, and that's a, that's a longer story. Yeah. Anyways, that was the first Jazz Hayden. I think was the first time I was like, "Whoa, okay, I need to think about this." And over the last seven, eight years, I've come to believe that abolition is the only way. Yeah. Um, so that brings us to the question: Is what is abolition? 
Yeah, well, maybe let's start with maybe the elephant in the room, right? So it's like, because whenever we think about what abolition. What elephant? What elephant? The, the elephant is prisons, right? So it's like, when we talk about abolition, everyone always goes to like the idea of prisons, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, what are we going to do with the bad people, right? And, and, and I think that is always such an interesting thing, right? Because even as social workers, we understand that, you know, no one is um, inherently good or bad. Mm -hmm. Yet so much of the ideas around like prisons is really predicated on like a good person versus a bad person. Because when we read a headline and we see a bad person commits a crime, we're less likely to actually ask why, right? Mm -hmm. Like why? And as social workers, we're trained to ask a why. And one of the things we fail to do is like, I think just ask a why have so many people of color ended up in prisons, right? Why are, you know, our justice systems, not only in America, but anywhere where, again, connecting this issue to the history and legacy of slavery and colonialism, right? Like anywhere where there is an influx of people of color who have been impacted by those systems, they are also similarly impacted by carceral systems, mm -hmm. right? And, and no one stops to ask why. It's almost like, you know what, people of color are just like automated, like criminals or bad people. So for me, I think that's the first thing, right? Like we need to ask like, why are so many people of color in prisons? Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, there's so much empirical research to substantiate that question now, right? So like for people that are against like prison abolition, maybe that's the first thing, right? Like why are so many people of color in prisons and why are you afraid for them not to be in prison, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then I, I think the second thing really is, is always a question of violence, right? Like, well, okay, I get that. Maybe the system is like, you know, corrupt and putting people in prison, but then people are still committing harm, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you and I have talked a lot about that. Like, obviously, you know, abolition is, is like not fully operationalized, right? Like we're going to have to figure out how to mediate harm for people who are in communities creating harm. Yet we also have to acknowledge that the majority of people that are creating harm in communities are people who have been harmed historically by capitalism, harmed historically by colonialism, harmed historically by racism, and have experienced immense systemic violence, right? Yet there has been no accountability for those systems. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't like totally like, you know, answer the question, but I think it really acts as people who are against like prison abolition to think a little bit deeper around that issue. And even, you know, like again, we're often talking about like accountability. Where's the accountability for slavery? Where's the accountability for mm -hmm. like systemic racism, right? Like mm -hmm. we're often quick to talk about the accountability for the people within the systems and, and like not talk about the system itself. I mean, it, I, there's yeah. something about that that like, out of abolitionist work and thinking, I have come to believe that we can't get anywhere without reckoning with our past. Yeah. And I wonder about like where that, I think that is a part of the abolition work yeah. is reckoning. Um, but there's, and there's something maybe connected to that, that like the, an abolitionist uh, sort of viewpoint is that the system is not broken, it's functioning exactly as it was meant to. And I think in reform efforts, there's, it's sort of easy, and I fall into this, to think, okay, the prison system is broken. And if yeah. we're like shooting for safety and well, good relationships and justice in some sort of more socially just sense, then the prison system is, and the criminal legal system is broken. But the logic of abolitionism is that it's working exactly as it's meant Absolutely. to be. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, we, first of all, we have a constitution that legalizes slavery, mm -hmm. right? Like, and, and I mean, that is just like really skipped over in so much of this conversation, right? Um, and why this is important is because slavery was the engine that built America and slavery, the engine that built America was the exploitation of people of color, right? Mm -hmm. And when you take one engine out of a car, you need another engine to continue it to go, right? Mm -hmm. If your intention is to keep it moving. And you, you have- say, say what that engine is. The, the engine is the carceral system, yeah, and, right? And, 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 and economic system and the economic based on system, the exploitation uh, of black people. Exactly, capitalism, right. colonialism, mm -hmm. the legacy of colonialism, and, and our prison systems, mm -hmm. right? And, and these systems have like unabatedly exploited like poor people of color in the United States with very little consequence, right? Like there's been no outrage whatsoever that we have the longest system of like slavery right. happening in America legally, right? So I, I think your point is really powerful. Like there has to be, I've always felt like there has to be this really awareness, right? 
of what these systems are before we can even begin to engage in any type of conversation towards change. It's sort of like reinf like con sort of expanding upon what abolition is. Like, why is reform in and of itself? And we can talk about reform yeah. in a moment and what kinds of reforms we are more liberatory or not. But why, uh, why not reforms in and of themselves? Like, if we look yeah. at if the history since slavery to today, why hasn't reforms been enough? Because um, that leads us to abolition. Absolutely. Right? Well, I mean. You know, Bowen says Bowen says two things. I mean, I'm just going to paraphrase. Bowen says a lot of things. I know, but he, he does. But I'm just going to paraphrase the ancestors in two things, right? So it says nothing can be, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed till it's faced. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes back to, again, like really the history of this country. We've yet to reckon with the history of this country. One of the things that was even so interesting being a sore was that we were talking about reparations. And, you know, there's still such a dissonance. Like we're talking about, like given land that's not even ours to give. Mm -hmm. We're on captured land. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like, so this is so complicated, right? Um, and I think the second piece uh, goes to, um, again, like, right, we, I lost my train of thought, <laughs> but. We're talking about why reforms have not worked. Oh, and, and this is the second thing with Baldwin, right? So he says that, like, he talks about reform and he says, we, we've had, you know, the 13th mm -hmm. Amendment, we've had the Civil Rights Act, and. And what has that gotten for us, mm -hmm. right? And not to like, you know, shame people who've worked really hard for those things. But in reality, we're still like economically, um, we're, we're still at every disadvantage yeah. that we were in 18, six, 1965 and in, in 1865, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the progress reform has been so menial. Mm -hmm. Like it's been so menial in a large scale. Um, and you and I have kind of like begun to joke around like reform is is like to me harm reduction, mm -hmm. right? Like how do we, you know, minimize the harm of people who are impacted by these yeah. systems versus actual transformation? And I think it's very important. And it's not that we should, you know, like shame people that are doing reform work, right? Because reform work is necessary like till we have transformation, but we need to call it what it is, right? We can't, you know, be doing reform work and, and talking like it's transformation. Yeah. I think, uh, let's talk about reforms in a moment, yeah. but like uh, there's very little in our history to say that reform in and of itself is getting at the like root causes and the root logics that lead us yeah. here. So even in the last 10 years, you have so much more money and attention and uh, efforts being made to try and change the criminal legal system. And yet the numbers, the total numbers of people in jails and prisons in the country have not changed. It's yeah. gone up and down in different places. Um, so I, I'm trying to get at why, like, what is abolition and why, and then, yeah. and then particularly why social work. So I want to come back to the question about Absolutely. reforms. But like, what is what does social work have to do with any of this? Well, I mean, social work first, right? Like, as social workers, our organizing value is like social justice, right? And and as a profession that's organizing social justice, we have to recognize that we are living in one of the greatest injustices in the history of this world, mm -hmm. right? Like, we have a, you know, we have literally a you know, it, it's almost, we have a continuation of slavery. You know, like slavery was an abomination to humanity. And we've continued that. We've continued that in carceral systems, right? Where in, in a world that only represents 5% of the world's population, we have 25% of the world's prisoners. Mm -hmm. And those people are, again, people who look predominantly like me. So let's, let's talk yeah. about like how has social work what has social work's role been in the development of mass incarceration? I mean, I think social work has done a lot to perpetuate these systems mm -hmm. by not educating their students around these issues. You know, one of the things we talked about at SOAR was just the lack of content in a profession that has its organized and value in social justice and who have students at every intersection of this issue, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, our profession is at every intersection of this issue. And as Matt Epperson's research pointed out in 2012, in my research through my dissertation, that less than 5% of schools of social work had content educating students mm -hmm. around these issues. So while this may feel like, okay, maybe this is just an omission, right? It's scary to think about what practice has been when our predominant modalities have been behavioral change, right? Mm -hmm. So as, as a profession that has seen itself more as clinicians and social workers in, in the last you know, few decades, and we're showing up to spaces, carceral spaces, spaces that where people are impacted, and we're negating the histories. We're negating mm -hmm. their histories. We're negating the histories of this world, and we're asking them to just like make better decisions. Yeah. You know, I think it's very much in line. I, I saw the uh, Dave Chappelle skit uh, "Sticks and Bones," 
and, 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 and he referenced the um, Nancy Reagan, just say no, right? right? Just say no, right? Like, and, and, and I think this is what our profession has been, to yeah. just tell people, like, right. no, just make better decisions, right? Yeah. And, and, and it's really negated the histories that people live under. And this is much aligned with, um, and OG had said this to me before, um, what's her brother's name, Mikhail. Mm -hmm. um, Mikhail said to me, and, and you know, I was mad at you, Mikhail, when you said this, but it was so true. He said mm -hmm. that what's social, up, Mikhail? peace. Mm -hmm. He said social work, you know, like I don't know a lot about social work, but he said that, you know, social work feels like um, a lot of it is to make people um, comfortable in their oppression. Mm -hmm. And I was really upset by that. But, you know, when you ask that question, what has social work done to like promote or to continue mass incarceration, it's that, right? Like we, by our lack of acknowledging these issues, by our lack of like training students, you know, who are working in communities, we, we have essentially helped people to be comfortable in their oppression. Yeah, and but, I mean, training in and of itself is useful, but mm -hmm. what the training actually consists of, if it's still about individual, individual culpability Absolutely. and pathology, then we're sort of reproducing the same yeah. things, but I'm gonna do one thing and come back. So. One thing to say about abolition, at least as I understand it, is it's mm -hmm. literally abolishing prisons, police, jails. That 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 long term, those are not the the systems and responses that we want to have in our society. And that's a hard thing to come to terms with. To make yeah. decision every day to be like in the face of all of this harm in society. That that's actually what we we want something else. Yeah. Um, and so training and educating uh, and coming up with a concept of abolition social work is saying like social work has a role to play in that larger project of abolition and it's not just it's partially about educating students that they are interfacing with carceral systems but how do they navigate the people they're supporting the systems they're trying to change absolutely uh, and what is their analysis so absolutely. I think that, that that's where they sort of come together yeah um, I mean it's kind of like again we, we've talked to you you've given me this great platform right so I like to think about like decolonization mm -hmm. right and 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 decolonization essentially kind of like posits that colonialization not only stole land, right, but it really created our ways of knowing, being, and acting, mm -hmm. right? So if we understand our, knows of, our ways of knowing, being, and acting are shaped through like white supremacy and ideas that will ultimately continue to promote white supremacy, mm -hmm. then we need to dismantle those. Those are the areas that we need to check in um, and, and realize that this has to be like a parallel process, right? So it's like we're not just showing up to change systems, like, you know, we also have to recognize that we are inherently part of the problem. Like, mm -hmm. right, we have all drunk the Kool-Aid. Yeah. And, and if we're not showing up with that parallel process, right, if we're not creating educational spaces that aren't shaming students, but, or even shaming professors, but are mm -hmm. also like just really saying like, yo, we, we don't know. Right. You know, a lot of this we don't know. And I think this is why even you know, sometimes when we talk about like abolition, so much of abolition is imagination, yeah. right? Being able to imagine something greater than what is currently the yeah. now. And once we recognize that the whole thing is coded in patriarchy and white supremacy yeah. and like that, we're never getting anywhere if we don't deal with those things, we still have to deal with the fact that human behavior leads to really violent things and harmful yeah. acts and how do we actually contend with that yeah and I think uh, uh, Ruthie Gilmore I think this is her quote but it's like abolition isn't just about absence it's about presence and what yeah. are we building instead both at like a societal level but also at individual sort of like what do we do when harm happens yeah. Mariam Kaba shout out to Mariam Kaba yeah is one of the the pioneers I would say of transformative justice and community accountability and what do we do if we know we can't trust this, the police which many many communities yeah. can't then what do you do to stay safe? Yeah. Um, and she's done an amazing work around that. So let's talk about what does abolition social work look like in practice right now? What do we, what do we, what does it look like? What are we doing? Well, I mean, I think the first thing is like, we just gotta start by recognizing that we're part of this system. Mm -hmm. You know, like again, it, we have to just really pause and honor that. And it's no shame, right? Like again, no one is trying to shame. Like I love this profession. I feel like this is a profession that is most suited to actually do the work because our values are there. You know, our values are there. Like, we have values for humanity, dignity. Our values are there. We just have to really look at the ways in which our actions aren't aligned with mm -hmm. our values. We have to look at where our pedagogy isn't al aligned with our values, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, like, when I think about social work and abolition, I think that's just the first part. Just, you know, like, 
you can't fix anything till you, you know, like stages of change, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have to recognize that we have a problem. Yeah. And the problem is not just the systems, right? The problems are us. Yeah. So I think just A, recognizing that we have a problem. I would say, and I'm freestyling here. Freestyle. I, I would say B, like we, we then need to really like create community. Right, like we, this, the, because this can't be like um, abolition or ideas around transformation are not going to be like me saying them or you saying them, right? Mm -hmm. Like they have to be co created. Yeah. So we have to co create community. Um, in creating community, we have to be trauma informed. We have to understand that, you know, like Bell Hook says, it's not a matter of if, but when. Mm -hmm. Like there's going to be tension, right? Like, you mm -hmm. know, and, and um, Freire, and f not only Freire, um, but like what's going to happen is that we we've all been like socialized to see the world in mm -hmm. different ways that are congruent with what Paulo Freire calls the banking system of education. Right. Mm -hmm. And when we get together, it's like we're going to have conflict. We're going to create dissonance. Right. Mm -hmm. And and when in dissonance, people are going to be uncomfortable. People are going to react differently. So in building community, our communities have to be trauma informed. Our communities also have to have some social contract. And like mm -hmm. we have to say, you know, um, Bell Hook says this really amazing thing. She says we have to look at our ethic and see are we organized in love or are we organized in um, power and domination? Mm -hmm. and, and most of the ways that we have historically been organized is in power and domination. So then like if we're going to be in community, what does a love ethic look like, mm -hmm. right? How are we going to communicate with each other? How are we going to hold each other? How are we going to be accountable to each other? Mm -hmm. And even when we talk about like um, accountability in communities, right, like outside of social work, I've often thought that it's like such a fallacy that we talk about, you know, like individual accountability and negate like community mm -hmm. accountability, right? Mm -hmm. So that individual that we're asking to be accountable for the harm, where's the accountability for the community yeah. for him yeah. or her? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's often like totally lost in yeah. the conversation. So I, I don't feel there can be any accountability unless we are as a community saying, hey, here's what it's going to look like. Here's a social contract that is um, befitting of all of us, mm -hmm. right? Not just you occasionally, but mm -hmm. befitting of all of us. And then three, I, I, I think, you know, based on that, we have to move towards action. Mm -hmm. Like we have to have like tangible steps that are aligned with like abolition. And I mean, one of them that's really clear, it's like, yo, we got to be anti-capitalist. Mm -hmm. You know, which is like, you know, you know, it's going to seem like crazy. So, mm -hmm. continue saying. Yeah, I mean, we have to be anti-capitalist. Yeah. We have to acknowledge that, you know, capitalism is a system of exploitation mm -hmm. and specifically exploiting poor black and brown people, right. right? So, I mean, you sort of started from like the internal work we all have to do ourselves yeah. to into our relationships and then into sort of starting to get at the like yeah. systems and structures and ideologies. And so... I'm maybe gonna come the other way from the top, if yeah. you will, which is starting with like Absolutely. what are the ideologies and paradigms that inform all of our work, mm -hmm. and I think we do have to start with ourselves yeah. um, and our our own values and how are we showing up every day. But there's something about like when when have you heard uh, any sort of teachings around like explicit anti-capitalism in social work schools? Never doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, and that's a question. Why, like, yeah. why doesn't that happen? I mean, we have yeah. some answers to why. Mm -hmm. um, or even colonialism, right? Like, how can we not talk about colonialism? There's, there's yeah. no a push for that, but I, yeah. there's a push to decolonize social work, mm -hmm. at least in some universities. And, and that's a lot, it's going to be a long road to yeah. actually do that. Um, but there's something about naming and disrupting and reckoning with the past yeah. and the current ways that the past is showing up and the current ways that capitalism shows up right now. Getting away from the nonprofit industrial complex is incredibly hard for all of us. Mm. I spent last week writing grants, at least part of my days. Yeah. It was terrible. Yeah. I hate it. Yeah. But I mean, that's the thing, right? It's not like shaming. We we have to acknowledge like how these systems like support us by giving us no other alternative. Mm. But then we also have to believe that we can create something else, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I guess there's, I'm trying to think, I, I've been thinking about this a bit. There's like naming and disrupting the ways that social work has been complicit in. Yeah all types of oppression in particular as it relates to criminalization and incarceration uh and then there's like what, what are the what I, there are social workers who are already doing what, what I'm sure. we're conceptualizing as abolition mm -hmm. social work which is a term that i actually learned from this this guy craig fortier um so i don't think it's a defined concept yet and not yeah. to say that uh it will ever be a, a settled I'm concept sure. but like 
uh, Wakumi Douglas, who spoke with us at SWER. Shout to Wakumi. Shout out to Wakumi. She runs an organization called Soul Sisters Leadership Collective, and they're doing a lot of work to build power of young women, girls, yeah. and gender fluid folks. Um, they're also doing work connected to the system. They're doing diversion work, but they're doing it in ways that I think Miriam Cobb would say, Miriam Cobb would say, is like the locus of power is with the organizations, not with the law enforcement yeah. agencies. Um, Cassandra Frederick, uh, who we tried to get to swear, but <laughs> couldn't come because she's so committed to yeah. her, her her work, which is great. Um, uh, but doing dope work. Doing dope work at the Drug mm -hmm. Policy Alliance, including a campaign to reckon with the, the, the harm of the war on drugs. Yeah. So just say that there are some folks already doing abolition-oriented social work in their jobs, and yeah. many of us are doing that outside of our jobs. Absolutely. I'm a part of something called the New York City Transformative Justice Hub, where we're organizing spaces for people to come and learn about transformative justice, and at some point, hopefully gain guidance and consultation yeah. when they're actually doing the work. But that exists, that's a small little effort, grassroots Absolutely. effort. So there are many ways that we can do abolition social work, and we're, it's an it's a early idea, Yeah. Um, but it's an exciting idea. Is there anything else you want to say before we end our time today? Well, I mean, this has been dope. I think this is a good start. I think just in one thing that I think of, right, so everyone feels like this has to be this huge, like, theoretical conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what can we do in practice? And I mean, I think something as simply as, like, seeing people as people, mm -hmm. right? Like, especially people who have been impacted by crossroads systems, you know, Eddie Ellis, an OG of this work, Eddie you know, Ellis. Greer Ellis works Greer with Ellis. you. What's up, Greer um, Ellis? You know, we, we still like ex-con parolees, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what, what's uh, all these other derogatory terms, right? And in our work, if I, I feel abolition at its core is people-centered, mm -hmm. right? Like we have to see people, like no one's their worst action, right? No one is their worst action. And if we're not able to see people as people, we will continue to replicate systems of harm. You know, like not seeing people is at the core of all levels of oppression, right? When we stop making someone a human being, that is a primary factor of oppression. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think that for folks that really, you know, maybe be like, yo, abolition, it's, it's still, I don't get it. You know, like, I, I think if you're a social worker and you're someone for justice, just start there. Just see people for people. Be willing to show up for their narratives. Be willing to hear their stories. Be willing to check into your own biases, right? Mm -hmm. Two things. So maybe, you know, like, see people as people, but also be willing to check into your biases. Be, able, be willing to do your work. Be willing to sit with ideas that you have that have been shaped to maintain the status quo, mm -hmm. right? Like we all have those ideas. So I think it's important for us to check into some of those things. I mean, I appreciate too that it's yeah. that uh, abolition itself is is a big idea and it's an everyday practice. Yeah. And whatever abolition social work, how it evolves, will both be everyday choices and decisions and a bigger organizing concept. And I think the one thing that I would end with is um, Mariam Kaba, who is someone who I've learned a great deal from, uh, was talking the other day about how we need to study. And mm -hmm. like that's not the only place, only thing we need to do, but we need to study. There are people who have been doing work around abolition, in particular prison industrial complex abolition, but obviously abolition of slavery for, for yeah. a long, long time. And there's much to learn from the people that came before us and the people that are here today. So uh, one thing I'll commit to today is to continue to try and study um, mm -hmm. in the midst of a PhD program, but yeah. to keep studying keep learning. I mean, maybe the last thing I'd add to that too, right, is like we have to start to see these issues as intersectional, right? Mm -hmm. Like as, as a white man, what made you feel like, oh my goodness, this is my issue, mm -hmm. where so many white men have not checked into this, right? Mm -hmm. and, and for people that don't have a direct experience of a lot of these systems, like what, what will make you show up for this conversation? Mm -hmm. And maybe to end with um, Baldwin, who just like, we can just talk about Baldwin all day. Baldwin, Bell Hooks, ancestors. Talk about studying, right? We could just study the ancestors. But um, he, he talks about like our proximity to the fire, right? And he says the fire meaning that like we can't have humanity if anyone's humanity is compromised, mm -hmm. right? And I think till we are, as a society recognize that if anyone's humanity is compromised, our humanity is compromised, then like we, we will never have justice. Mm -hmm. We'll never have like abolition is nothing, right? So, you know, shout out to Kimberly Crenshaw, but intersectionality has to be 
like imminent, mm -hmm. right? Preeminent in this conversation. We have to move beyond this is your issue, this is my issue. We have to move beyond this idea of allyship, especially when it comes to abolition, mm -hmm. because all our humanity is at stake, right? Like if someone's humanity is compromised within the system, like all our humanity is compromised within the system. No one is free until everyone is free. No one is free till everyone is free. Peace.